Oh, welcome back. I hope you are back. Um, yes, we're going to now go into the council itself and its aftermath. Let me just begin by reminding you of something said right at the end of the first part. There was nobody who doubted the infallibility of the church. The only question was, where, where exactly does that infallibility lie? And in a sense, the, the question is, can um, a general council in defiance for Pope pass uh, a, uh, make a decree uh, that is infallible? Can a Pope make a decree without reference to the church? Um, is it necessarily a combination of two? And that's the area they debate. It's not whether or not the charge of, of, of Jesus Christ to Peter uh, was to have um, a, a guarantee that the church would never err, that the church would never lead people away from a saving faith. So the, in 1869, well, in fact, in 1867, the Pope decides there will be a, a council, and it's two and a half years in the making, which, apart from anything else, leads to an enormous press campaign in the Catholic newspapers, which are very powerful amongst the faithful. Um, and they are running campaigns for and against what's going to happen at the council, and there's a lot of informed leaks about what is being prepared. The, the council is an interesting thing. I mean, it's, it's a long time since the previous council. There have been 21 councils in the first 1,500 years, so in almost every century there had been at least one council. And then suddenly, after the Council of Trent, which had reformed Catholicism in the wake of the Protestants at Schism, um, for there had been an th over 300 year gap. So really, the, the, although they had to rely on historians to tell them how to run a council, uh, information was actually quite limited and, of course, necessarily disputed. Three and 18 years since Trent. Um, and the, one of the big issues is how should the how should it proceed? What should its what should its voting mechanisms be? What sort of um, principles should govern the way in which it debated? Should they simply be given documents that have been formed by the groups that the Pope had named and vote yes or no? Did they have a right to debate? Did they have a right to change? And um, uh, all these issues are very much rigged in one direction, um, as we will see. Um, this is what Pius says himself about the Council, so that this extra, by this extraordinary means we may better be provide for the extraordinary needs of Christ's flock. Provide for extraordinary needs for Christ's flock uh, at, um, by extraordinary means, and it, it is the background, how do we stop the advance of modernity? How do we stop secularization? How do we stop liberalization? And what is the best way of doing that? So next slide, please. Let's have a look to begin with at who actually attended the council. Well, there were 997 bishops um, in December um, uh, 1869. Uh, plus, and they're all invited, obviously, plus the 70 heads of male religious orders. Um, and that makes a total of just about 1,060 voting members. Uh, in addition to which, the Pope will appoint um, the leading theologians from across the church who will be advisors and who will advise the committees. The total number who attend is, a, is at some point is 783, so that's a pretty healthy number. Um, and in the first month when it first gathers, it's well over 700, it's about 721. But boredom, frustration, and the appalling kind of conditions under which the council met meant that disheartenment set in. And by the end, in the last month, there are only 440 on an average each day. There are a lot more bishops in Rome than that. So when it comes to the final vote, uh, there are 555 in attendance on the final vote. But the number actually attending, listening to one another drone on um, is about 440 in the previous months. Amongst those bishops who attended uh, more than a few times, 243 come from outside Europe. They come from the Ottoman Empire. They come from the mission territories um, in Africa, in Asia, 
and in uh, China and Japan, predominantly French. Um, the, the, obviously, the, the other great imperial powers are Protestant. There are um, 67 bishops from the United States and Canada, 51 from Latin and South America, 61 from the Ottoman Empire and the Slavic lands, uh, 41 from Asia, 8 from Africa and 10 from Australia. And there are a large number of bishops who make up the Curia. Uh, I couldn't find a figure for that, uh, but I would guess it would be, uh, be something over 100. Um, there are 240 Italians, they're the biggest single um, ethnic group, and that a large number of those will be Curia. Um, more than half of the bishops, uh, including the missionary bishops, come from Italy or France, and the, the, the dominance of France is very striking uh, because of their, and of course, although these missionary bishops are serving in mission territories, they are all born and brought up and educated in Europe. So we go to the next, uh, the next slide, those for and against having a decree on infallibility. So the infall infallibilists, almost all missionary bishops um, are infallibilists, in part because they are told to be. Uh, the, if, you're, if you're a missionary bishop in Africa or Asia uh, or Latin America, you have very, very little chance of getting any money from propaganda fide from the committee that runs the missions if you don't toe the line. Um, I mean, from the period I know much better, the 16th and 17th century, there was effectively no mission to Scotland when the, the English were having lavish money for, fed to them for the, uh, for the Jesuit and secular mission. There were only ever eight, about eight priests in Scotland because, because propaganda feed, they didn't trust the Scots, didn't think the Scots were serious about mission. So they just starved them of funds. And there was a clear threat, clear threat to the missionary bishops that they didn't do what the Pope wanted. They wouldn't get their diocese funded after the council. And the Curia, as always, um, was, was loyal to, um, to he who had appointed them. So that gives you a really solid block of votes. And the bishops, in, uh, the territorial bishops um, in the areas that were under, under um, the normal uh, rules, um, divide relatively evenly. Uh, and the substantial majority of Italian, Spanish and Irish bishops um, and the heads of religious orders are for infallibility, um, and the uh, and the great opponents of infallibility are the German and English bishops, most Northern European bishops um, as well, and deeply divided um, are the French and the American bishops. And the basic division is, is 65 to 75 percent infallibilist, 25 to 35 percent inopportunist. And the 10% wobblers there are those who believe not in majoritarian, but in moral consensus voting. That's they, they don't think the decision should be made by simply arithmetical count. They think that there has to be a buy-in by everybody. So you have to make concessions in order to ensure that everybody can accept um, reality. Now, a, a large number of that minority who are going to be very unhappy with a definition would accept a definition if their main concerns were met. And of course, the problem was they weren't. So on to the next one, key players in the council. And here we see the English Archbishop of Westminster, Henry Manning, 14 years, uh, well, 20 years after he, be, he became a Catholic in, uh, at the age of in his forties. Henry Manning was the most important figure at the council in pushing through the decree um, that we saw at the beginning. He is a very close friend of the Bishop of Regensburg, uh, Bishop Ignaz von Sanistrae. And uh, when they'd been in Rome together um, for the um, 1800th anniversary of the death of St. Peter, when hundreds of bishops had come to Rome to mark the 1800th anniversary of the death of Peter, um, Manning and Senestre went and knelt side by side by the tomb of Peter um, in, in St. Peter's. And they prayed to be given the power, to be given the, the means 
to promote papal infallibility. They felt solemnly bound by that oath. And they are ruthless in manipulating the uh, processes of the council to ensure that that happened. They are supported by a number of very powerful and effective um, um, French speaking bishops. Bishop Louis P of Poitiers is perhaps the most important of the Frenchmen. Archbishop Victor Deschamps of Mechelen, which is Brussels. Um, and also very important and influential in, in wheeling and dealing um, outside in, you know, um, talking to people and persuading them is Cardinal Paul Cullen, the Archbishop of Dublin, and a very powerful, um, I mean, a sort of, um, um, a kind of George Powell before his time. And then from the Holy Office, Cardinal Luigi Bilio and the Secretary of State, Giacomo Antonelli, uh, right-hand man to Pius, um, not as ruthless as Pius, a, 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 a wheeler dealer, but a very effective wheeler dealer. On the other side, the inopportunists are led by um, Bishop Felix Dupanreau of Orléans in, in France, Bishop Henri Marais, who had a sort of position in France that Newman has in England. Um, he'd been, the Pope had absolutely refused to make him a bishop. The French, the French College of Bishops had really protested about his exclusion. So the compromise is that he was made a bishop to a part of the world in which there weren't any, any Catholics. Um, he's made what he's called in part, in part in the in, in, in infidel places. So he was made a bishop, but he wasn't given um, a diocese with any Catholics in it. Um, and that was that was uh, that was accepted. And the Archbishop of Paris, uh, Georges Darboy, who'd been um, a disappointment to Pius, is also a, a, an important inopportunist, though a moderate one. Um, there's Bishop Ossip Frostmeyer, who we saw earlier on, who, who talked in such withering terms about the servile Senate um, making um, the Emperor God, making um, make, deifying. Um, pious. And on the English side, the, the most outspoken uh, was Bishop William Clifford of Clifton. The, another important amongst the Americans, the leader was Bishop John Purcell of Cincinnati, and I'll be quoting him a bit later on. Amongst the theologians, uh, the most uh, who was in uh, there and really lobbying very hard for um, the uh, inopportunity and the, in, in the imp impropriety of defining the um, in, uh, infallibility in the way it was intended is um, a great German from Munich, um, Ignaz von Derlinger, there's an umlaut on the O, um, Ignaz von Derlinger, and he is a very close friend of Lord Acton, who is in Rome throughout lobbying very hard and trying to get um, some coherence. So that's the kind, that is the kind of um, lineup. Now, if we move on to the next document, next slide rather, just a couple of documents which I think are important to bear in mind. <clears throat> um, the 1853 um, um, encyclical inter um, multipliques had, be, had been a really controversial one because the Pope had decided he would universalize liturgy, ensure that there is a, a common liturgy across Christendom and sort of disallowing all kinds of local variations which had grown up in the centuries since, um, since Rome. It was, it was for Rome, not individual bishops, to decide on the precise, the precise content of, of the liturgies. And he'd anathematized Gallicanism. Gallicanism is the, is the French um, um, doctrine on the relationship of church and state of a partnership of equals um, and that the bishops are as much uh, as much subjects of the king as they are uh, members of the college of bishops um, and that, that had been a, an issue for between the popes and the french church for centuries always, as it were, the tensions eased by the existence of concordats in which the interests of church and state were, were sorted out. 
But now, uh, any anything at all which reflected an acknowledgement of any of any allegiance to anybody but the Pope was disallowed by that encyclical. In 1854, uh, the Pope um, issued uh, Ineffabilis Deus, the Ineffable God, um, defining um, Immaculate Conception. Almost everybody welcomed that, but the tone of that is already showing uh, the decision that it was his decision, that he would define it. He didn't need to take advice to define um, uh, a, central, a central teaching of the church. And then in 1864, Quanta Cura, the document which contained the syllabus of errors, and it contains um, uh, itself citations of about 30 other encyclicals. And one of the anxieties that the, um, that the inopportunists have, uh, one, of their, one of their concerns is that, um, um, I've, I've, got, I've just got to go to the front door, somebody's making delivery. Right, I'm back. So, um, um, the, the, the fear that all the all the encyclicals contained within the text of Quanta Cura would become infallible if you made Quanta Cura and the syllabus of errors. So this is why the stakes are very high. People are really frightened about what, how wide the spread, how wide the spread of any use of, of, of um, infallibility would be if, if the Pope did what he clearly had in mind, which was to turn quanta cura into an infallible statement against modernism in all its forms, democracy, pluralism, um, and so on. At the council, um, there is, a, there is a dogmatic constitution on the Catholic faith against the manifold errors of rationalism, um, originally, originally presented as apostolic immuneris, which is revised to become Dei Filius, um, which is brought in, but although it's approved by the council, it, it is never promulgated. And then there's the dogmatic constitution on the church, Suprema Pasta, the Supreme Pastor, first introduced in February 1870, out of which comes Pastor Eternus, the first dogmatic constitution on the Church of Christ. And one of the things which causes a lot of, of, of uh, concern if not, and real anger is that whereas Suprema Pasta was going to be a, a, going to be a definition of authority within the church with the definition of all the different levels of authority in the church and affirming of the powers of bishops in their diocese and and um, the and a discussion of papal authority would be fitted into that um, the decision is made to remove that which I think was the 11th article in the in um, in Suprema Pasta and to make that as it were um, a decree on its own and connected with the wider questions of the authority within the church. The process which is created is that before the council from 1867 the Pope was appointed um, five leading cardinals to receive suggestions of what might be, be heard at the council, to sift them out and decide what to go along with. He produces five um, uh, commissions to produce documents for the council, which he, ch he chooses them obviously all himself, and that's, that's obviously fine. But then when the council meets, it's decided there will be no debate that there will be a, um, a, a reading of a document from the Curia. There will be a, a, a series of set speeches, one after another, without any reference to one another, which will be listened to and notes taken by um, a revising body. And that revising body will then come back with revised version which can be voted on, and that might need to be done two or three times. So crucial was who would be responsible for revising the documents. And it has to be said that Pius said, the council must elect a committee of 25 who will actually do the vetting. They will listen to everything that's said, and then they will produce the revisions. And it's that point that Manning uh, and Bonestray 
get together and they lobby, they create their own list, uh, a fixed list of 25 names, and they get block voting for their list. So every single place, every single place on the revision committee are hardline infallibilists. And that, that refusal to allow, as it were, the um, revising process to be done by a cross-section of the council, reflecting the range of views in the council, is one of the things which causes the greatest anger and, um, and, and debate. So they meet in, the, in one of the transepts of St. Put and St. Peter's uh, in the middle of winter. Um, uh, it moves on into well, the hottest summer in Rome in, in, in history. So a fridge turns into an oven and the poor old bishops are sitting there either freezing or boiling, baking, that's baking. Um, and uh, they, because it's in, it's, in, it's in echoey part of St. Peter's, huge high ceilings, uh, before the aid of modern, um, modern uh, sound systems, it, people can't hear as bishops drone on for an hour or two hours. They can't, they can't really understand it. On top of which, of course, it's all in Latin. And by the 19th century, people can read Latin very well. And of course, liturgically, they use Latin all the time. But can they understand free, free Latin? Hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, obviously, bishops, before they make their speeches, will get, will have um, expert Latinists helping them to, to write their speeches. But listening to them day after day, droning on when you can't, when you're freezing cold or boiling hot. Um, I mean, this guy's going to go on for about two hours and only repeating things that people have said many times before. It was an absolute nightmare. A nightmare as a process. And in fact, many bishops were silent, not because they didn't have strong views, but because they simply didn't think their Latin was up to it. Right, so what are the arguments? We can get we could go through it day by day, but I tell you it'd be terribly tedious because the same arguments come back again and again. So if we move on to the next slide, the key arguments for infallibility, uh, these what they, they are. Skepticism of the world. The, the world's skepticism about religion, the world's distaste for religion, the world thinking had grown up beyond religion, required clarity about, um, about something to have been true since Jesus' commissioning of Peter that need to be put in an authoritative, clear statement. The attacks on te papal temporal power needed action and they needed swift action. Things were moving quickly. You couldn't call a general council um, if there was going to be a major threat. And when you got this major threat, you need to define what was what was um, um, what was going to be anathema, what was going to be a cause of excommunication, a cause of exclusion from the church. You had to do it swiftly. You didn't have time for a general council. The advance of false ideas, as, as the bishop saw them, the advance of false modern ideas, democracy, rationalism, pluralism, needed authoritative rebuttal. Now, you might say, well, the general council could simply have, have voted on that. But again, there are new threats all the time. I mean, in, in, in recent years, for example, you know, um, civil marriage had been introduced even in some Catholic countries. And there had been very considerable um, uh, international um, protest about an incident where um, up in Bologna in the Papal States, there had been a Jewish family with a little boy called Edgaro, Edgar, Edgaro. And Edgaro had um, um, a Catholic nurse and he was in danger of death. So the nurse baptized him. And once the nurse had baptized him, um, the rule of the Catholic estates was that no Catholic could be educated other than as a Catholic. So the, 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 the papal authorities from Rome kidnapped the boy, or he went in and seized the boy, brought him back to Rome and brought him up as a Catholic. Uh, his distraught parents appealing to international opinion and getting a lot of traction. And the Pope certainly thought again that clarifying why this was the right thing to do for the sake of Edgaro's soul. Um, you know, he needed enhanced authority. <laughs> Ironically enough, Edgaro finishes up as a rather good priest. But, but, you see what I'm getting at. 
So in a fast moving world, the papacy needs to act fast and not to have to wait for slow, cumbersome councils. The need for greater discipline within the church where new false ideas were getting traction. Wissenschaft is, is the new, is the, is the, is the hermeneutics, is the new ways of scholarship. And the, the papacy's deep hostility to historical criticism, to linguistic criticism. This, 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 this notion, this horrendous notion that um, Mark may have been written before Matthew. I mean, um, that had been solved when the Vulgate was established, which, which order they were in, etc., and so on. That alone, that alone, the story of creation and Genesis, the literal truth of Genesis. Um, so dialogue with schismatics, uh, with ca Catholic theologians talking to Protestant theologians about things where they could agree. Dangerous to talk to heretics. They don't know any truth. Uh, and this was endangering the mission of the church. It would deal with dissent from the syllabus of errors by making um, the dissent um, a matter of schism excommunication. And also, and this is certainly something of Manning emphasized, that the, the clarity and certainty and, and, and the glory of a, a Pope who was infallible would lead to a flood of conversions. Thought. Let's move to the next slide and look at what the key inopportunist uh, arguments are. The key arguments are that infallibility is always laid in the church, but it's always laid in general councils. The popes are advised by general councils promulgating documents which are created for them by general councils. It didn't lie in the papacy of itself, but in the papacy in council. It was a scandal. Um, to the faithful who that who'd always been taught that that in many countries the conciliar theory had been part of national catechisms one of the things that Pius wanted to do was to create a universal catechism to replace the freedom which every country had to develop its own catechisms and that would have been one of the things that would have to be be removed so the church the constitutional monarchy not as an absolutism the popes have on occasions been denounced by general councils as heretics, as popes were in the fourth and fifth century. And most importantly, the case of Pope Honorius, who was a seventh century pope, who was anathematized after his death for heresy uh, by the third council of Constantinople for arguing that Christ had one will, not two. He had two natures divine and human but only one will which was divine and that was um that was deemed to be heretical but the important point here is that a council had ruled a pope to be heretical no pope had ever ruled a council to be heretical the council this council has not been free but predetermined that is not a council in which there has been freedom for the spirit to speak for a council which had been had been inhibited by its processes into producing a result which one side wanted, but and particularly the Pope wanted. That it would infuriate secular governments in both Catholic and Protestant countries, and in the latter it would increase persecution. And indeed, uh, Gladstone in England did threaten to reintroduce penal laws um, in the wake of the 1870. Um, decree. And in Germany, it unleashes what's called a Kulturkampf, which is um, an attack on the freedom and independence of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the church. For example, the state would interfere over what was taught in schools and would control uh, the appointments, um, uh, church appointments and educational appointments. Now, as I say, the, the many people are, are have feel unfree. I mean, they feel that they have no choice but to go along with the um, uh, the argument uh, um, uh, that, 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 that was being pushed through for infallibility um, because of the because they wouldn't get any they would they they wouldn't get any money from the propaganda to carry out their missionary work and so on. 
but a lot of them just didn't want to have the scandal of division. They were really, really didn't want the church at this time. The worst thing possible thing would be for the church to the church have another schism. The worst possible thing would be for the church to be weakened by a major dissent. And the Pope knew perfectly well that it, that that actually in the end the vast majority of people would would go along with it, however much they hated it, how much they disliked it. So the desperate pleas, the desperate pleas of the inopportunists to be given some some modification. And I'll give you an example in a few minutes. That is. Um, that means that actually in the end the Pope can rely on the fact that nobody wants in the with the mess the world is in nobody wants a schism so let's go to the next slide and here here is the voting um when pastor eternus came up for a, an indicative vote that's it, what do you in, how are you inclined to vote? And this isn't a binding vote just let's have a look at how, how opinions are there are 451 plaquettes of which at least 350, 300, no, so about, sorry, about uh, over 300 are missionary bishops and the curio. 451, non plaquette 88, so 88 actually vote against the decree. 62 say, well, if, it, if we could have some modifications, we would accept it, but not in this form. That means 150 in effectively non plaquette on this text, and 50 abstain, 50 just sit there not voting which in a way means the vote is 451 to 198. So it's, it's about 70-30. Uh, by then, quite a lot of people have left in dismay. Now, and it's then going to be a final and determining vote. Ask, well, the second vote will be asking the Pope to, um, to promulgate the decree. Um, and are on the 850, 850 train out of uh, Rome to the north, um, more 57 bishops climb on board that train so that it's outside uh, Roman territory when the vote is actually taken. And when it comes to the vote, and you'll see the numbers voting uh, is, is 150 less than in um, the 13th of July, it is 533 to two. And a very obscure bishop from South Italy and someone from the swamps of Florida who probably didn't know what was going on. So they didn't know that 70 of their colleagues had got on a train. They weren't amongst the ones who'd been asked to join the train. Um, and they, they rapidly they rapidly withdraw their non placket when they find out <laughs> they're on their own. Let's move on. Let's how does how does Newman in 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 um, England view all this? In the middle of the council, he writes to his bishop, Bishop Ullathorne, Bishop of Birmingham. He writes him a deeply personal letter of his ang anxiety about the way things are going, about what he's heard, about the, the way the, 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 the way the process is being corrupted, and the unhappiness with the principle of overdefining, uh, overdefining, and particularly with defining infallibility. And this is what he says to um, Ullathorne: When has a doctrine de fide of faith been a luxury of devotion and not a stern, painful necessity? Why should an aggressive, insolent faction be allowed to make the hearts of the just to mourn? Why can't we be let alone? Well, it's a very powerful letter. It's got a lot, lot more like that. But I've quoted that bit because of that phrase, an aggressive, insolent faction, including, of course, his own Archbishop Manning. Uh, Ullathorne shares it with, with people who um, he thinks he can trust. And the people he thinks he can trust share with people <laughs> they think they can trust and inevitably someone leaks it to the press and uh, so <laughs> imagine new in big trouble uh particularly over that phrase an aggressive insolent faction uh, but it was intended as a private communication and here in another private letter which wasn't leaked is a, his view this country is under propaganda and propaganda is too shallow to have the wish to you to you such as me i love the pope personally but propaganda is a quasi military power extraordinary for mission countries rough and ready it doesn't understand an intellectual movement it likes quick results scalps from beaten foes by the hundred so he's not very happy is he 
Uh, but, you know, he says, well, you know, we may need to have uh, non-intellectual uh, people running the mission territories, but really in, in, in the in the advanced societies, there should be freedom of thought, freedom of to debate, freedom to argue. And here he is writing to an Irish bishop, Bishop Moriarty of Kerry. Have the men who entertain such a project any regard at all for the souls of their brethren? Aesop's frogs said to the boys who threw stones at them, it's fun for you, but it's death to us. I love that. <laughs> I love that. So he sees himself as a frog and he sees Manning as a naughty boy throwing stones at him. Hey ho. On to the next one. So here's what Bishop Purcell of Cincinnati, I mentioned earlier, had to say. The council began with a comedy of an invitation to the Protestants and will end with a tragedy of excommunication. So it began by the, by the Pope very half-heartedly invited Protestants to come. He said, because this will be an opportunity for you to see you've been wrong and to rejoin us on our terms. Um, and um, uh, Purcell thought that was, that was, that was laughable, um, a laughably rude in, in thing, but it will end with a tragic excommunication, which indeed it did. What about Manning? Meanwhile, Manning, Manning is in his is in his element. I must insist that in the consistent practice of the church, one cannot find mention of the means used by or required to be used by the Roman pontiffs when they define truth or condemned errors in confirmed councils. He has just no doubt. He's deeply unhistorical. He simply reads out of history anything he doesn't form the tradition he approves of. So he, he just rides roughshod over all the examples of popes being overridden or being being wrong in the past on matters of faith and morals. I've never understood how if the Pope was not infallible without the bishops or bishops without the Pope, one of them could give the other what neither has. He, so he doesn't think, he obviously only reads that one way. The, the, council, the council can't make the Pope um, infallible, the Pope makes himself infallible, he makes himself infallible in terms of the tradition that he, that he inherits. And the arguments next, on the next slide from William Clifford, arguing for the English, and with from a distinctively English thing, a, a speech which, which cut a lot of, uh, made a lot of people impressed. We've always instructed our people about the infallibility of the church in the collection of votes of the whole Catholic world. But it cannot be that this new definition, especially if it is done in such a hurry, without any explanation, can be reconciled with the doctrine of the infallibility of the church as we have handed it down to them. How great is the fear of priests and lay people that if definition de fide as a faith were passed in a hurry, the faithful would defect from the faith. How great is the fear. And of course, it happened. There is widespread defection from uh, the Catholic Church as a in England. As a result, there is none of Manning's mass conversions to it. There is desertion from it, and not simply of co of converts returning to the Church of England, but of, of uh, cradle Catholics deserting. The question was introduced in haste and outside the prescribed order of business and on its own without raising the issue of the relationship between the primacy and infallibility of the Roman pontiff and also between the authority and teaching power of the bishops. Now, all those are from his speech in Latin um, in St. Peter's and they caused grave offence. And later on, Clifford uh, withstood enormous, um, you know, withering criticism from the Pope. But the thing that hurt him, hurt him really deeply, the thing which really hurt him was the Pope telling a group of French pilgrims, so just an ordinary group of French pilgrims, there was a bishop in England who spoke against my infallibility simply because I didn't, hadn't made him Archbishop of Westminster, sour grapes. And that really, really hurt Clifford. But... He gritted his teeth and stayed with the church. There's a there's a kind of board, there's a um, I'm running out of time, so I have to be I have to be hasten. But I must mention uh, Cardinal Filippo Guidi on the next slide. He's a he's a Dominican uh, bishop from northern Italy. 
he he was one of the, those people who wanted infallibility, but thought we need to we need to take everybody with us. So he suggested the addition of the phrase "factor utimos est inquisito." Inquisitio. After due inquiry, as is the custom, the Pope will can make an infallible decree after due inquiry, as is the custom, I say by council. And he's called in by Pius the Ninth, who, who shouts at him and berates him and accuses him of ingratitude and of toadying to politicians. When Guidi replies that surely an infallible decree involved considering the tradition of the church, Pius says, Io, io son la tradizione. Io, io sono la chiesa. I am the tradition. I am the church. Power has gone to his head. You know, one of, one of um, Acton's most famous sayings is all power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Later in the day after this, this uh, terrifying encounter with an enraged Pope, Guidi tells his friends, we have no freedom in this council. Under this pressure, what sort of validity will the decrees of the council possess? A pope who destroys the rights of bishops and in consequence, the authority of the council. So the council ends in disarray, 70 bishops on a, tra on a train going north, uh, as it were, absenting themselves. Lots of people unhappy, forced through Pope claiming victory with 553 votes to 533 votes to two. Um, and um, what happens? Um, well, within 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 two days, the French decide they're about to be attacked by Germany. The French pull out their troops, as had been looking likely. And as soon as the French troops depart, the Italians march in, occupy Rome, and the Pope is effectively a prisoner in the Vatican uh, for the next 50 years. He's he and his successors refusing to accept the occupation of Rome, but unable to do anything about it. And it's so preoccupied by all this that all thought of using their, their, their supremacy when, when they're desperately trying to get international support for their cause for the restoration of independent Rome, um, that they don't, they, they, they don't, they, they don't use the, the decree. Only once since 1870 as a Pope issue used the, the decree uh, to define something, it was to define uh, the Assumption of Our Lady into Heaven in 1950, at which nobody could possibly disagree, surely. Well, nobody did. The English bishops agonise over it, but in the end, all, give, all accept it. But they absolutely refuse to, to take stern action against those who um, uh, are talking against it. Think of Humini Vitae. They had always emphasized that bishops are sovereign in their own diocese, that, that the Rome is there to make sure that there is no heresy, but beyond defining heresy, bishops must be free on matters of discipline. In Germany, in the end, no bishops, no bishops go into schism. In Germany, the intellectuals rebel, and 5,400, I think it's 5,400, mainly intellectuals, leave the church, including many professors in German Catholic universities. And, and, and Dellinger, I mentioned before, the leading intellectual um, historian in Germany. Um, and they all go off, because they haven't got a bishop, they all go off, um, some of them, many of them are priests, they many go off and join up with the old Catholic Church in the Netherlands, which had, which had rebelled against Rome in the 18th century as a tiny, tiny fragment of, of people who keep um, the faith, um, they believe that they are not heretics. So they are, as it were, the, the, the Fevris of the 18th, 19th century, and Derlingshire's group become, as it were, liberal the Febris, if you can see it that way round. Um, and in England, Clifford agonizes and then and then he refuses to, to attempt to go to see Manning when Manning wants to put a national statement out 
he refuses to go, as do most of the bishops, they refuse to issue a general statement on behalf of all the bishops. Only Manning has to do it on his own. Uh, and they write their own letters, which, uh, which do state what's happened, uh, but do not threaten anyone with punishment for non-compliance. Um, one of his priests, one of his priests, uh, Canon George Case in Gloucester, a very, a, a very, a, a very lovely man, who had spent all his all money to build a church in Gloucester for the for the Catholics of Gloucester. He does pre preach initially against uh, the the way in which the decree had been brought in, and um, he is um, he is told by Clifford to, to be quiet. But Rome interferes. Rome comes in and demands to know. Uh, what he's doing about it. And I know Adrian's been lurking. He obviously wants to stop me. But can I have two minutes, Adrian? Yeah. I just want to finish with Newman because Newman is serene through all this. He writes, you know, the, 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 there is an enormous denunciation of the damage which is done to, to, to relations between church and state, Catholic church and state, by Gladstone, the prime minister. And in a very powerful um, response, um, Newman. Um, Newman says this, there are those among us, as it must be confessed, who for years have conducted themselves as if no responsibility attached to wild words and overbearing deeds, who having stated truths in the most paradoxical form, who at length have done their best to set the house on fire, leaving others the task of putting out the flame. The English people are sufficiently sensitive to the claims of the Pope without having them as in defiance flourished in their faces. In looking at Newman, Newman is serene because he thinks because he has another sense that it's not that the truth proclaimed by a pope is an ultimate truth. Not even a statement made by a council is an ultimate truth. The ultimate truth will come from a sensus fidelium. The, the faith, the, the, and this is what he says, like I'm jumping ahead to find it. Um, now, I haven't got time, but basically Newman, Newman says that across Christian history, popes have made mistakes, bishops have made mistakes, the people of God have not made mistakes, and they will sort out the wheat from the chaff, and the truth will always, through the Holy Spirit, works in the whole church. So two things, and I really will finish, Two things that are important about Newman, the Newman, which are not all that often uh, said. The first is he believes that there is a natural and healthy tension between centralization and decentralization. There has to be a center of authority and power, but there also has to be a decentralization so that the faith can express itself in the in within local context, like in, in local anthropological contexts. He says, in former times, there was not the extreme centralization um, now in use, that, we, that the church is becoming too centralized. There isn't enough dialogue between the center and, and local churches. And the second and even more important point, and my very last point is, the natural tension between, uh, between um, three things, authority, which is essential, tradition, which is where the sensus fidelium is mainly to be found, and conscience. And conscience has to be informed. That's why you need free debate, you need free discussion, you need freedom for Catholic teachers to explore the faith, to explore the meaning of scripture, to explain the nature of scripture, that those three things are always in tension. They will, and if any one of them becomes too powerful, the church suffers and that a healthy church is one in which the tension of authority, tradition, and conscience are struggling to be in harmony. I think that's his greatest teaching. I think actually myself that if Newman was alive today, he would be most worried about conscience, an uninformed conscience, people saying it feels right, I want to do it, if, if it feels right, it is right. The threat for in 1870 was overweening, overweening authority. Now, it will be overweening 
free conscience. And Newman wouldn't be any more comfortable to us than he was in 1870 to the Pope. Thank you very much. Your Well, in uh, something under two hours, John, you've just opened up so many different avenues, the avenue of the history of the church, the avenue of the political situation, and then very extraordinary revelations that many of us won't have known about the way the council worked. I know there will be things which we might want to connect with the Second Vatican Council. Um, the problems and the issues in the church really stay the same, but maybe Vatican II has uh, adjusted, well, we know it has adjusted things a bit so that um, we, we've got a fuller kind of picture of the way things work. I, um, I really look forward to listening again to this. It's going to be, for everyone out there, is going to be on the What Good News website, which is whatgoodnews.org, which actually recently has been revamped. And so John will be there as a YouTube um, performance. As soon as you go to the homepage, there he will be. And there will be more things coming uh, that we will do. This has been recorded in the second lockdown, but I think what John has done is open our minds to bigger issues, but issues which are so relevant to the way we behave as church and the way we behave as society. And so many of these issues, you know, one person thinking they, they've got all the answers. Oh, don't let's even begin with that. So I want to thank John very much for all the work of preparation and his presentation today. I want to thank Paul uh, for setting all this up to us. And we will be uh, letting you know of further uh, events live stream, absent people or present people, who knows, let's hope we can get together very soon. And in the meantime, let me wish you all very well and thank you for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>